Well, thank you, Liz. I'm sure we've committed some major securities violation reading disclaimers with rap music behind it. There's probably, I'm sure there's a category, no reading disclaimers with rap music at the same time, because you, you may have missed the key points. So, anyway, that was good, I enjoyed that. Anyway, thank you all for coming. Thank you for getting up early. Thank you for joining us. Um, it's a great opportunity this year. We, we really, one of the things we really try to do in Urbana is to keep people informed as best we can. And, uh, you know, one of the things I really want to try to explain to people, and probably we should have more dealers at these things to explain it to the dealer community, but what is Urbana? Urbana is basically a company that doesn't have a clicker that works. Oh, that one. A one-stop investment portfolio. This is going to be a long morning, I can tell. It's a one-stop portfolio. That's really when you look at it. And, and what do you mean by that? Well, we have public equity and we have private equity all within the same bailiwick, if you will. And that's important because uh, our, one of our lead portfolio managers in, in, in Caldwell Securities pointed out that approximately 1% of, core of companies are publicly listed. That's 99% are not. That is, the average investor is not participating in that 99%. Now remember, in that 99%, probably 70 or 80% uh, are ma pa operations. That still leaves a market that's 20 times bigger than the publicly traded markets. And like it or not, that's a key factor in going forward because more and more now, it used to be you'd get this hot new public issue when a company went public. Uh, it's, you have to take too long to go public now. It takes a tremendous period of time and costs. The costs of being a public company are quite extraordinary. So people are delaying going into the public market for a lot longer time. That is, you're not coming in during the high growth phase. You're coming in during the unload phase when the private equity investors, they're leaving when you're coming. And you really want to be in earlier on in the game. And that means for many, many investors, you have to do this. But the private equity area has typically been an area exclusive to high net worth individuals. Urbana makes it possible for people who are not high, worth in, high net worth individuals. So that's a very, very important thing. Uh, the great advantage we have in Urbana is we have permanent capital. Uh, we can take a long term strategic view. Um, Mr. Gandhi's pointed at something here years ago. He said, you know, you've taken 10 years or years to become an overnight success. And that's true because a lot of private equity, I mean, we've been involved in the CSE for 11 years, 11 years and it's been a tremendously successful investment. But we have permanent capital. We're not faced with redemptions. We can be involved. We can participate, sometimes even assist with the growth in these companies, and we have our time. And the, the individual investor, they may need that money. They may need to want to help their kids buy a house. Uh, they may want to bail one of their kids out of jail. They may need money for something or other. <laughs> you just never know. And, and the problem with private equity for the smaller investors is you can't lock up for 10 years. We can. So the beauty of their banner, you can come and go as you wish because it's a publicly traded company. So time is our advantage. And, and very often in the mutual fund business, it's a disadvantage. You know, mutual funds get their money at the worst time. They get it right at the top of markets when everybody's enthusiastic and they lose it at the bottom of the market when people should be buying. It's the exact opposite, you know, buy high and sell low. We don't have that problem. The one challenge we do have is if we take a position and it goes against us, we have to trade our way out of it. We don't have new money coming into mask or errors. So that makes, I mean, for example, at one point we had New York Stock Exchange locked up stock when we got, after it went public, it was $94 a share. It went immediately in the financial crisis to 15. You gotta do a lot of really smart trading to, to make that money back. So that's one of the disadvantages, but the real advantage is you got permanent capital, you can take a long view, you can take 10 years to become an overnight success. So that is our advantage. What are we, okay, what are we doing with private equity? We try to, 
invest in businesses we understand. If you'll notice in our Urbana's portfolio, there's a, there's a skew to financial services because that's where we live. And we do, some days, understand that business reasonably well. We know what works, we know what doesn't work. Uh, I was looking at a, another investment firm recently, and um, I didn't even have to look at their statements. I just walked through, talked to people, saw their facilities, saw the location of the facilities, and I thought, no, nah, this company's not gonna work. You know, it's just, you know, you can just tell from that because we know our business and we know the people that are involved in it. And uh, so for us, businesses we understand. We try to way, stay away from the hot, inflated sectors in the market. Um, and, and, you know, some people can do well at that. But our style is a little bit more conservative in that we're trying to contain downside because, as I said, we make a mistake or we get hooked on something we have to trade our way out of it. So we really try to be somewhat risk adverse as best one can be. You're never gonna be 100% that way, but these hot issues, you know, you're gonna have 50% up and you're gonna have 50% down uh, in very short time frames. We're not geared to that. When I was a younger guy, I was a position trader for a very large firm and I would trade in seconds. Um, I'm getting too lazy for that stuff now. We're going for value as we go in our portfolios now. We like to have a big enough ownership in a company that I can pick the phone up and talk to the CEO or the CFO and understand what the problems are. And sometimes, even given my long, long, long experience, I don't like to think about it, um, maybe provide some help occasionally. So that's really important. Pick the phone up and hear this communication. I tell everybody in our firm, we're not in the investment business, we're in the communications business. And that's the most important thing is communicating what you're doing, because if, you're, if you've got a problem going on, tell the clients, tell the prospect, tell the, uh, your shareholders, here's our div. And I, we always, we've always done that. You know, you call me and ask what's going on. Um, a, I will always return your call or I'll always return your email. And B, I'll give you as clear an answer as I can understand at the time. I hate doublespeak. You know, we get enough of that in politics and media. Um, a management team versus a personality. Uh, that's so important because the, the, the smaller you get in a company, earlier on stage, it becomes extremely dependent on that dominant personality who's running that company. And he or she may be great or not great or flawed, and we're all flawed in some way or other, except for myself, of course. Um, well, everybody has, you know, well, I'll tell you one company. We were involved in a company, it was an incredible company, the biggest special effects company in the world. And uh, the, the, uh, the president and the CFO were, uh, well, there were two areas in life where creativity is discouraged, flying and accounting. And these guys were being a little bit over creative. I blew the whistle to the CEO. And uh, so we had a series of meetings and put in a new president. And I, I, I go to the first meeting with the new president. And the first hour of his monologue, I think this guy's pretty smart. Hour four of the same monologue, I'm thinking Castro doesn't speak this long. So I called, this, I called the chairman. I said, we've just swapped one whack job for another one. And I remember going home that night and being really depressed. And I said to my wife, you know, I'm the only semi-normal person in this company. And I don't know anything about computers. And it was great, a wonderful company. You could just see it eventually, whoom, straight on into the ground. Totally unnecessary, flawed. Per so you want a team. We used to invest in the States through a company called Massey Birch out of Nashville. We were involved in Corrections Corp, etc. They always had two people. So you can have a wingman or people supporting one another. That's really, really important. I think Warren Buffett says invest in companies that can be run by an idiot because sooner or later it will be run by an idiot. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, you can be an idiot running, say, Bell Telephone. I'll, I'll end the comment there. But you're not going to blow the company up because you've got a team of people around you. So this personality thing is very important and you want a team that's supporting or whatever over the years. And, and I, I too have been very fortunate. I've had very good partners, strong partners. Um, and and uh, right up to this day, uh, Brendan and all the team around me, just terrific people around me. They're actually smarter than I am. I don't tell them too often because I'd have to pay them more, but, but um, bright, bright, bright people. And that's important in any company. So that's something we look at. We want to look at a team, not as an individual. We like companies that are innovating. Um, you know, we had a, a private company that went public some years ago, uh, uh, Real Matters. And it's, we, did, we made a lot of money. We stayed too long at the party. It's come down again. But what they did is they took the appraisal business and they, they 
added systems to it, computerized it. So instead of calling Billy Bob and Poughkeepsie to get an appraisal, if you're a bank, you could go online, you could value, you'll get valuations of appraisals, you could pick who you wanted, and it was all um, sort of, how could I say, organized. Fun throw is one of our, they're going to speak later on this morning. They're, they're like that. They're innovatives in a bit like factoring. Factoring, the factoring business is as old as Moses. You know, you're, you're funding receivables. You know, if you sell something to the banks, of course, the banks are going to take 120 days to pay you, and you're going to go bankrupt in the meantime with your overheads, etc. So this way, with fun throw, you're on the system. You're in the system, your customers, you can push a key, and you have that money in your bank account. So it's, it's an old business, but innovating an old business. We like companies that are scalable, that you can, you can get big, if you will. A Blue Ocean is one of those, and you'll hear them talking as well, because this is a company that, um, you know, we've, we've seen great success so far, but as this company grows, you're, it, it can go to whatever you want to be, you know. Try to think of uh, people in Asia trading American securities during their daylight hours. The numbers amazing when you think about it, if you could really penetrate that market. Uh, or Americans now trading American securities overnight in their market. So that's a massively, massively scalable business. Some businesses are very high touch, which means you can't scale them that much. Um, so that's just one example of scalability. The, the other ones, uh, speaking beyond scalability, is how can we make things better with our expertise and our funding? And it's quite interesting um, we often will fund a company in an early stage. Morning, Patrick. <laughs> I'm living the dream. Um, the, the, very often you come into a company in a new, earlier stage, and as Brendan has pointed out to me very often, you always need a second round of financing. You know, you'll do a financing, and then the reality sets in. It takes a bit of a little, you know, new enterprises take twice as long um, and cost twice as much, like home renovations, uh, Barry, <laughs> than, you, than you originally planned. He's an expert on this business. Um, so that kind of thing. So can we make it better? And we, it means we have to come in. And sometimes we have to come in and spend our time uh, and our efforts and helping management out. Uh, I, I look at my job on, on, in the Caldwell companies, CIM and, and Caldwell Investment Management and Caldwell Securities. My job is like Queen Elizabeth. Uh, my job is to warn, encourage, um, and advise, and that's it. Um, and that's what we do in these companies, and I think we sometimes make it better. We like frequent and easy communication with management. As I said earlier, I want to call you, and you want to call me back. If you don't call me back, we're out. We're looking for a buyer. You know, it's just that simple. Because one of the things I use in business, and I use in our companies, is everybody knows everything. You know, there are no secrets. Everybody knows everything. Now, not outside the firm, but inside the team because that way we can help each other. Almost every disaster I've seen in business, when it's when somebody says, don't tell so-and-so about this, or don't tell them that, or don't let these people know, you know, there's something going on. As soon as you see that, that's a huge warning flag going up. So that communication, and when we don't have communication, you know there's something wrong, something's being hidden or, or whatever. Um, we tend to want, don't stay away from pre-revenue companies, that is, Startups, I, 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 you know, the older I get, I'm not interested in good ideas anymore. I'm interested in can you execute? I don't, I don't care if it's a dumb idea. If you can execute well, it'll work. But if you're brilliant and you can't execute, that's just a phantom. That's, that's, that's a ghost. That doesn't mean anything to me. And I, have, I listen to great ideas. And, but if you can't make it happen, you know, it doesn't matter to me. I don't care. So that's a very important, very simple concepts. Um, we tend to have, looking at the public companies, our style, maybe this is, uh, you know, a more mature style, because we have, in, in Caldwell Investment Management, we have different styles. We have really bottom-up, really in-depth grinding research right into individual companies. Um, and in, in Urbana, it's a little bit different. I tend to have a, a, a strategic style, big picture overview. Um, generally top-down. I look at strategic stuff, and um, I'll give you an example. Uh, you know, as you know, as you know, in Canada, we are obsessed, our government is obsessed with climate change, and what we're going to do is wipe out the energy business. So having mastered Economics 101, 
I've realized that when you cut supply, the price tends to go up. And uh, so as soon as the government went on that uh, hobby horse of theirs, we just bought a bunch of energy stocks. And they've been spectacular performers for us. So it's a strategy style. The picking up the company is almost secondary in, in, that, uh, in that exercise. So I think that that's kind of where we go. Look at what's happening in the world. What's going on? How do I, how do I capitalize it? How do I make this work? This is in the public companies now. Um, I tend to take large caps in the company because remember we have small caps, smaller caps in the private, but we tend to go big caps in the big stuff in, in the public markets because they're the ones that provide us with liquidity. Uh, they're the ones that, with which I can can have some water when you get a chance, with which I can trade a trend. Thank you very much. So I can I can play it. Oh, sorry, I didn't even see that there. That shows you how that shows you how observant I am. Um, the the the. Uh, the biggest fear on public portfolio managers have positions you can't get rid of. So for me, I want to have big cap companies. Generally speaking, I go to mid caps. For example, in the oil and gas, I had Suncor, and then I dropped down to uh, uh, White Cap and Tamarack Valley because some of the intermediates can have bigger moves. So we got the first move in the big companies, we moved to smaller companies. But we like to get big caps during periods of adversity. And the beauty with that is, is if you're wrong, you'll eventually be right. Eventually, they'll claw their way back. Um, we bought a lot of the banks post the bank crisis, and we now still have quite a bit. We've bought all purchases over the last while, so the large U.S. financial companies, uh, Morgan Stanley, Citicorp, which is the worst bank in the States. Um, because, again, I, I, I like, uh, Liz doesn't like me saying this, but I'm a little bit of a garbage man when it comes to public companies. I want to get something that's really smacked down, because just in so doing, I, I contain my risk-reward uh, calculations. So big companies during adversity. We go to mid companies you know, on an opportunic, opportunistic basis. If something's going on that we think is interesting in a company, it's a mid cap, we'll take a shot at it. We, we do have trading. We have longer term holding positions like the US financials. And then we have positions we'll go in and come out of on an opportunistic basis. So we do trade. I'm still a, a, a trader at, at, at heart. Value in non-indexed uh, companies. The, the, For those of you who aren't in the investment is, is, one of the great theories years ago was efficient market theory or efficient market hypothesis. And that was premised on everybody knows everything all the time. And, uh, and if everybody knows everything, everything should be in the price. Well, guess what? We have so many large firms, large bank controlled dealer firms. They are very often their advisors in great measure are constrained to investing in companies that are index included. They have to be big enough to be in an index. And uh, to be in an index, um, that's, that's how you can recommend them. And if you go outside to the smaller companies, mid-size, you're going to have compliance all over you very shortly. So what means is you don't have an efficient market. The stuff in the index is probably overvalued, and the stuff outside is probably undervalued. So um, we find value in, say, non-index companies as well. Um, it's worked. Our one-year performance around... Uh, 26%, our three years, 23%, our five years, 16%, uh, our 21-year performance. Um, um, our, our inception is not, is not uh, 2022 here, it's uh, 2002, 2002. So there, there's a misprint in us, so we're not perfect. So 15% over the last 20 years, annually compounded after tax. Not much as close to that.